everybody and welcome. This is Tavo D'Arcy. Hope you're having a good night tonight. And we're just thinking about the days in which we lived and the times in which we lived. And I felt that the word, the key word is divine flexibility. And that's how I've been living my life for at least 25 years because I realized that a lot of things were prone to get all stressed out if we're really time conscious and precise people. And I can be. I really am. I'm a punctual person. In fact, generally I show up early. If I have an appointment, I'm always ready 10 minutes early. So that's the, the good part of it, that you will be prompt. The other part is that you're stressed if you know because you're wanting to be prompt and so it's a balance but what I feel with life because there's so many variables so many tests so many things going on that we need to just hang loose and relax and be with the Lord let him guide us and this just be divinely flexible one of the things I relate to is you know the Bible says that James 3.17 represents the wisdom of God. It's pure, peaceable. Any wisdom or advice or, you know, actions of a relationship which are pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit without partiality, resemble God, basically. So the character of God is what we want to do in our life. Well, easily entreated plays a big part the opposite of easily entreated is like you're in a relationship you have to fight to prove your point you have to fight to win you have to prove yourself and then you're stubborn you might be very stubborn you won't negotiate and to me that is the most that's a bugaboo i'm i'm really always has been trying to live and abide in james three seventeen, especially be easily entreated that means easily to uh, disagree with, rational, not overly emotional about if we don't agree. And this pertains to theology. As a, as the maven of uh, apostolic theology is part of my, one of my facets in my field, I realized for many years, for decades, it's so important that in the Christian community that we get along and keep unity like Ephesians 4 community, but that we have our own right to hear God on how to interpret all the scriptures. That also goes back to Ephesians 4, the common doctrine. Keeping the law, and not law and order, that's a bad term. Keeping the peace and harmony and all the relationships in harmony as best we can with God's help. So having to win, you know, like one person says, I don't believe in wearing jewelry, and the other one says, I do, for instance, or someone has this big theological, theological difference, such as women speaking in church. So, you know, the Bible is filled with tests, and most of them are how we're going to act. Are we going to accuse somebody? Are we going to be rude to somebody, racially biased, or dogmatic and beat somebody out, go off and run off in a huff, whether it's our mother-in-law or our friend or our theological person that we don't agree with, our opponent. So if you're not a Christian, you know, that's your choice. But with a Christian, you're supposed to do it God's way by the book. And so when I was thinking of how to keep harmony and to be easily entreated, then that means that if you know your Bible, the ins and outs, the New Testament, not under the law, no legalism, then you can keep your conscience, not VPC, not be on a diatribe, not, you know, call people names. You know, a lot of people in the middle income realms out in the country, smaller ministries generally, maybe big ones too, but a lot of people in my history, not my parents, but a lot of people call people false prophets. That's pretty much the tongue talker crowd. All right. They're a false prophet. He's a false prophet. She's a false prophet. He's a false apostle. That is huge. It's huge. <laughs> and I've thought about that a lot. I've analyzed it. I try not to ever call anyone a false prophet or a false person by name. I'll talk about your doctrine. But I'll also mention that a lot of people accuse people because they're legalists. They don't know anything about the freedom in Christ to work out your own salvation. That's a command from Paul, to work out our own salvation. 
How would you do that? You study your Bible as one, be a noble Berean, pick apart everybody's doctrine, including your own. Apostle Paul praised the noble Berean Jews. He's the one that started this because they picked apart his doctrine, his teaching, to see if it was really lining up with the scriptures of the day. So common doctrine, which is a Pauline teaching, Ephesians 4, all of Book of Ephesus, one of his letters. All right, then it says that there are four doctrines which hallmark a true Christian. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God the Father of us all. That Those are the criteria. If you're a real Christian, you have to believe that. If you're going to be a real Christian, real saved Christian, then you believe there's one Lord, Jesus Christ, one faith, the Christian faith, one baptism, washing away your sins, in, in, you know, symbolic of that, and then one God, the Father of us all. Very inclusive, very uh, global, amazing. Prior to that, for the legalists and those who may not want to be resembling the maturity of the wisdom of God not easily entreated. It talks about relationships all getting along in long suffering, humility, walking in meekness and lowliness and long suffering, and all abiding by that continues on to the common doctrine. Well, that means that in common doctrine, you are responsible to hear God and research your own Bible to pick apart what you know the Lord is telling you is true. Now, you may be off. I may be off. That's this, the, we have to bear with this and pray about it and speak about it and teach what's true, but never talk down or accuse anybody. You assess them. If it's your business, you go and you think they're wrong, you up front love them and you confront them one to one and say, I don't believe this is right. So a lot of this is harmony and relationship theology as well. So if you say, I don't believe in this, I can prove it with scripture that men come in the gender of the accuser, which is true. <laughs> Genesis 3, Revelation 12, the only time Genesis and Revelation, the only places in the Bible these accusers mentioned for theological sake, it's mentioned in the gender of a male, the authority. So men, be careful. The reason I'm saying that is because of all the women that are labeled and stereotyped a Jezebel, because it comes in the female gender. And maybe there's a proclivity for being more of an accuser in a man, but not all men are accusers. And I'm not accusing men of being accusers. <laughs> Therefore, if I can be that unbiased, then I could say all women are not Jezebels, vixens, and whatever, dominating. Okay, so we got to get this, this theologically resolved to have more harmony, less accusation, less backbiting, and all this stuff. So in Ephesians 4, common doctrine, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of us all, that is just pointing out that those things must be believed to be the criteria of a real Christian. However, now we have to deal with all the other commands in the Bible. First, you go to the Old Testament, Ten Commandments, Levitical Law, the Pentateuch, the Torah, which we are all for, but that was given to the Jews and as a sign of, of how far the human nature can't measure up to God. Nowadays, Jesus Christ has come into our hearts as a Christian, male or female, and he writes in our heart and gives in the Bible, the New Testament, the way to behave. And it's not legalism, because legalism in the modern day Christian sense breeds accusation. Levitical equals critical. However, what are you going to do with all those teachings? There's Malachi tithe. There's all these teachings in the Old Testament. Thou shalt not. And according to, I'm submitting this to you, is my theology. Those are now valid, very valid, but they are not law. 
they are there to show us what God wants, and they are now precepts to teach and train on, role models. However, in the New Testament, you're not allowed, it is not your privilege to criticize somebody and haul them out and fuss at them and be old-timey back under the law Philistines or Pharisees. Let us now jump to, if you accuse using those laws, that shows you're back under the law and out of order. You can convict, you can assess, evaluate, and convince somebody, but you can't say all, you know, all this accusation, that would make you out of order. When you go to the New Testament, now we got the common doctrine, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, with God the Father of us all. However, now it's the relationships and the holy fear of the Lord and the community and being a good witness and being multicultural and diverse, all these things in harmony to witness the transform Ephesians community that affects society. You can read the rest of Ephesians 4 about that. Ephesians 2.14 about Jesus. He is our peace who's broken down every wall of partition to make us both one. What is Jesus Christ going to come back, our Savior, the second time for? The spotless bride, the winsome bride of Christ, not the pride of Christ, but the bride who's walking it out in meekness and lowliness in community, Ephesians 4, who's modeling James 3.17 on and off the stage as parents, as pastors, as mature persons, like the wisdom of God, pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit without partiality, respectful. And they're going to model that and it will transform the whole Christian community. So it's a good witness and people will value that and think, man, I, I need, I would like to be part of that. Now that also ties in with the church letter by the Holy Spirit in Revelation chapter 3, the church of Philadelphia. Is it two or three? You can look that up. But anyway, it's the the brotherly love church, sisterly love. It is the walking it out, love walk church that is the bride of Christ that is getting all ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus' return, and is joyful and harmonious, acting in James 3.17, wise, pure-hearted, and they are also knowing their common doctrine, so they're not criticizing, name-calling, calling out people from their pulpit, which I've heard, doing things like that, jumping people in public. Oh my gosh, there's so much stuff going on that has gone on that goes on. All right, so let us say here we want to prepare the body of Christ, but we want to be not in error in our Bible teaching. That's one reason I believe everybody right now should just get out your Bible online, your app, your real, you know, just get out the Bible and see if what you're hearing and what we're believing and taught on all these levels is really in the Bible. Such as, are they back under the law? With all this covering and thou shalt be under and over and under and hoops jumping and all that stuff, that is of the law. Now you sign up to be in their ministry, in their church, then you are on the dotted line and they say do it, you do it. But I'm not one that, I found that's not in the New Testament. That's just Old Testament law and plain old, I think, country backwoods teaching from the years ago. So <coughs> because I've been criticized, jumped in public and reason I know a lot about this action because I've been around in small towns, cosmopolitan towns, metroplexes, and now in a nice community of good neighbors and ministry, basically. So the idea is we want to help people not go through pain and suffering or inflict it and induce it on others because they're trying to follow Jesus and go to church. This is where all the actions happen in my case. Excuse me a minute. I get my turn around here. But um, so you have to know your common doctrine. That gives people 
the privilege to hear God for themselves. Now, you don't want to be PC, politically correct. You don't want to be biased. You don't want to be judged. You want to be a, a compromiser. We know that. So you want to be easily entreated. That means respectful if you don't agree. So let's say somebody says, I don't believe in wearing jewelry. And nobody in my fellowship believes it either. Now there are a lot more things, but, but I'm just going to use that. I don't believe in it. Well, they have a scripture. Because you know what? I'll be honest. And I do wear earrings. They just got lost. <laughs> in the Old Testament, to throw some... It said that the, and I don't, don't feel guilty now, because I'm not going to feel guilty, because we're not under the law, but in the old days, the earrings were really, the pierced ears were for the idol, little idols to hang down. So that is between you and the Lord, not my business. And see, that's another thing. The law, if, you're, if they're back under the law, they accuse you because they mind your business. That's a big sign. I don't mind your business. I submit and respect you not teaching dogma, so I'll present it to you as a sila. That means pause and think about it, and you hear God and see the Bible, the Bible for yourself. Research it. So let's jump to the New Testament. Now remember our way of testing the law. If somebody or a teaching or your conscience or you've been hurt and they're back under the law, it's because it's accused you. It's judged you, it's character assassinated you, gossiped about you, or told tales. Or it makes you feel so guilty. So we want to discern what is just God convicting you versus being accused. God will convict you, but he does not accuse. The Father assesses, he'll be up front and convict you, hold you accountable, but he will not accuse, the devil accuses. Let's go to the New Testament. We're going to say, these people say, I don't believe in wearing jewelry. And the other ones say, well, I wear jewelry. And it doesn't, I mean, I'm a Christian too. It doesn't bother me. And it doesn't bother me. Frankly, I wear jewelry. I mean, I don't wear fancy jewelry, but I wear my earrings and stuff. So, um, so then that is between you and God and the other person. So I believe that everyone should have their business and we respect their business. Now, if you feel it is your call to address that with someone, you do it in James 3.17. Respectfully, not dogmatically, not legalistically, or accusing. And you're not, you're going to be easily entreated, respectful on both parties. So if we realize that the ultimate goal is to be respectful, what is that? That means you're really valuing unity. You're valuing, valuing the relationship factor. You're valuing keeping harmony and the relationship unbroken. You could be stressed that they are really that off or that I'm that off or whatever. But that is your choice to be stressed. You just don't let accusation come out. That's the big deal in this. We need to train it, train it, train it. To leadership. All right, so we look at the Old Testament. Those are precepts. We don't throw them out, but we don't use them to accuse and turn critical Levitical with them. Then we look at Paul. Now, if you read Paul, Paul's the one that has taught me all this. Paul's teaching is about common doctrine. However, when you read all of Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, you're going to find that he writes some really toe-curling do's and don'ts. And Jude is one. And then all about males and females, about that. Now, I've because I've gotten, not my parents, not my dad, not the men that know me, the mature men, but immature snipers... <laughs> have really taken their pot shots. So it made me be a noble Berean. That's what starts this, the whelp, frankly. So I just got, what in the world? I've never heard people say what the, the you have to be under somebody. If you, you, you have to be covered. 
<laughs> so I, that's not Baptist. I'm not a ba I was a Baptist, so I know my, thank God for Baptists. Thank God for you normal people. You're not patrician, usually aristocratic elite. You're just really friendly. So grateful for that and black people. So we want to say, all right, I, I picked apart your doctrine and I found out all, all this stuff about the law. Two things with the law. Beside it being critical in Levitical, that helps you red flag it. You read, you have to get out your Bible, your own Bible, and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when Jesus Christ was alive, the Messiah, walking the earth before the crucifixion, before he went and got raised, you know, the resurrection, when he was walking it out on rough turf with relationships. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John read every relationship Jesus had in ministry with his mother, with real people, with children, you name it, and see how Jesus acted and reacted to males, females, old, young, like I said, his mother, and see if Jesus respected them, equal opportunity respected and acted in James 3.17, or was he an accuser back under the law, hurling invectives and sin spying? No. He was a no-guile minister. But you need to read it to make sure I'm right. So the only time that the accuser is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the religious system. <laughs> they were his nightmares. He triggered the religious system. So therefore, you can be a person, you can have a spirit in your countenance, you know, you can be fine and have a good conscience and live a clean life, and still the old devil's out there that, like a roaring lion, seeing who he will devour, male or female. So when you read your Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, not the Gossips, but the Gospels, and read how Jesus acted and reacted in every relationship, you're going to find he was not a critical person. You're going to find he never set up sin spying in his ministry. He never set up Jezebel watching because he wasn't afraid. <laughs> he wasn't, you know. And he wasn't devil conscious because he would taught authority over the devils. And so we want to do that. So we want to make sure we're doing it. Now see how he respected men and women equally and young and old equally, and sinners, how did he treat the sinner, that were, like the female that was brought to him, that was caught in adultery? Well, you know, the old, my favorite one, because I researched this, I know how people are out there, these kind of, the red flag Pharisees. So it is my opinion that when Jesus Christ was sitting there, minding his business, and the Pharisees, a group of men come up, and they have this woman they caught in adultery, and they're all glad. They think, now we're going to you know, get our joy juices going, because now we're going to stone her, which is part of the law, the critical Levitical law. All right, that was what they used to do in the Old Testament if they caught somebody in adultery. So they bring her over to Jesus to test him, and they throw her down. And they said, well, Jesus, here she is. We caught this woman in adultery. What are you going to do about it? So Jesus pauses. He writes in the sand. To me, that means he's letting God speak. Lord, how do we handle this? What do you want me to say? And how do you want me to say it? So then he looks at these guys, the group, the cluster. And he says, hmm, which one of you have never sinned? Let you be the one that cast the first stone. And I think, you know, with a group of men, my opinion is, uh, with a group of men, one of, at least one had lusted, maybe committed adultery two or three times, or one time, and maybe they'd, all, you know, fornicated. So whatever it was, that was the right thing to say, and they slunk away. The other thing about the Pharisees, I noticed, and this is a very typical whelp thing, Western European Levitical patriarchism. The, the big heightened, always focused about adultery, but it's only the woman they bring. What happened to the man caught in adultery that day? They only bring the woman. It's like the Salem witch trials. Anyway, I don't want to get off my track. So now let's look at our common doctrine, not being a compromiser, not being PC, 
not being a pain in somebody's backside, for being a literal, you know, finicky, picky, you got to win at any cost type person. But we're going to present this calmly and say, you can have your opinion. Hear from God. What about all those different kinds of sins and commands in the New Testament that Paul says, one of them, the major one, Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake fellowshipping with the saints as some have. Listen, when I grew up, I wasn't brought up around legalists because my parents were pastors. They weren't like, they were like fun. All right. Good people. Nobody thought, nah, 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 you're not going to, that wasn't the vocabulary. You just wanted to go. You just knew you're supposed to. So when I got a ministry where I used to live in my former state before the former state, <laughs> it was a small rural area, more a county, and I never realized how many people were preoccupied with everybody's business, but also they're not in church. And the guilt trip on the common folk is out there everywhere in the United States, the middle income and the, you know, the, the basic psyche of Christian is guilt. We're not going to church. You better go to church. Are you, are you covered? Are you in a church? So this is one reason we can teach on it to defrag accusation, because if you're looking around to see who's in church, who's covered, you're a lot under the legalists. All right. So then you think, well, um, is this a prison? Once we accept Jesus, are we supposed to be, you know, he's our savior, but is, is he our slave master? <laughs> Does he put us in a prison so that everybody's watching us, the guards are watching? No, this is why I'm teaching this, because you have to teach it. It's like a prison, certain places. And so we want to say, how do we handle when Paul says, do not forsake fellowshipping with the saints as some have? How do we take that? We take it as an admonition, an encouragement. Don't do it's really helpful. It builds you up. There's a difference in two or three that are gathered. He can be there, but that corporate anointing with lots of like minded people really has more power in it. More fellowshipping. If you find the right one that you're sent to, you just don't join anywhere. You just are sent. Otherwise, you could be in a prison because there is a lot of legalism out there. It's very testing. So the idea is you go and you pray. But here's my opinion. This is my opinion. God holds everybody accountable. Everybody's responsible. Everybody's accountable to him, not to me, not to anybody else, but to him and you to do it all. To do everything that Paul says, everything, whether you're white, black, or brown, all right? To do it all. However, he knows, God really knows. You can't do it all. You're not perfect. You have what is technically called in the Bible, besetting sins. Some people have weaknesses in some areas. Some people have authority in some areas. Other people have weaknesses in other areas, and some people have other authority in other areas. So everybody's unique, and we got to teach unique right now, because it's very destructive and painful to teach stereotypes. It is too lost the cutting edge, lost the compassion and the empathy that God makes and affirms unique individuals that he specializes in unusual unique individuals male or female black white or brown or tan it is his joy to celebrate the human made in his image with all these different hairstyles and looks and colors and ethnicities it's so cool all right he's an artist so we look about and we want to be like jesus in acts 10:38. Jesus went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. And the Lord was with him. He approved of him. Jesus went about. He, he, he had relationships with people. He liked people. He respected them. 
He wasn't rough. He wasn't rude. He wasn't holier than thou, all right, or proud. So he went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. But guess what? He didn't oppress the people with his law. He didn't oppress people with his rigid, dominating, any kind of dominating religion. That was Phariseeism. That was the religious system of the temple. So Jesus represented the Father going about doing good, having relationship, respect, E-O-R-R. But when we look at the Pharisees, they were the opposite. They wanted to preserve their income, their power, prestige, their precious prophetic mantle or whatever it is. So they were a bastion of efficiency, a bastion of the system, but they weren't efficient, effective in showing the love of the Father, the Creator Father. They were too finicky and cloistered and unyielding and monetary. So we can learn from that. We better learn from that. So Jesus went about doing good, dressed in his Middle Eastern earth suit, not a blonde, not a, you know, not a Caucasian. He went about doing good. Now, I like to think, you know, if I look back at history in the Christian first church, what was it like? Were they big corporations? No. Were they legalistic systems? No. In the first church? No. Were they monkeying around, minding everybody's business, playtime ministry? No. They had serious work to be done. Were they legalists? Well, certain ones because they hadn't been saved but so long and had to be taught. And Paul had a big issue with being legalistic because he had been raised under the law, yet Apostle Paul had been a major Pharisee before he got saved. He was a major accuser so much that he murdered the first many Christians before he got knocked off his high horse. So a lot of things go on, but let's narrow down our talk. All right, we have Ephesians 4 Common Doctrine, which is not, not heard of right now. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God the Father of us all. Then we have to go through all the different commands, such as, it says, Wives, submit to your husband. That's Ephesians 5.22. I say that because that is often, often historically used to accuse women, to put them into control, beat them down. And see, I wasn't raised around the law like that. Nobody thought like that. In my family, none of the women, they were strong, capable women with great husbands, happy families. So we also notice that those who seem the legalists teach, you know, you've heard it on the movies, you've heard it on TV. You're not submitted. She's unsubmitted. That is a, a to me, it goes back to more country teaching, I think. Hate to say it. So, I have to point out as a noble Berean that nobody who teaches like that, accusing people, accusing the female of being in rebellion, those people are usually not, they're pretty much not submitted to relationship, respect, <laughs> confrontation, James 3.17, all that. Anyway. But those kind of people who put down a female and make it a controlling issue, the man is over the woman, they are not noble Bereans and they don't know their Bible. They have no clue of Ephesians 5.21 precedes 5.22. Ephesians 5.22 says, wives, submit to your husband. But it's not hard. Unless people are mean. <laughs> because of 521, it says, walk, everyone act in, walk in uh, mutual submission in the fear of the Lord. That is mutual submission in the fear of the Lord, man and woman that are married. All right. Mutual submission in the fear of the Lord with the husband being the tiebreaker. To me, that's like Genesis Adam and Eve, God formed chain of command to keep order in the home, but no dictator, no big I, little you, slave, waitress, that type thing. 
That is a human carnal ego mis you know, mistake to teach like that other. So we look at Ephesians 5.21 non-legalistically. But everyone walking in the meekness and lowliness is really, that's Ephesians, the first part of Ephesians 4. So it ties right in with James 3.17. It ties right in with mutual submission and the fear of the Lord in a home, in an office, in a business, in a ministry, in a fellowship. These things are relationship priorities. They take time to teach and nobody wants to teach it because it doesn't make them happy, joyful, and money. doesn't talk about money and bless me. So we want to balance our ministry because what in the world is going on when people don't want, you know, this past week, a few days ago, it was written that more Christians don't go to church than do. I understand. <laughs> I can go both. I like, I like to fellowship with the saints. I just don't like it when it's a prison house or they're back under the law. Or they're they they're they're not healthy in relationships. They're about themselves and protecting their own work. It really is disturbing. That's why I teach doctrine. That's why I teach authority. That's why I teach equal opportunity, real respect for the office of every human made in Christ in God's image, whether they're a Christian or never want to be. It's basically that bad in America about the pollution of what is a Christian, what's the poison, and, you know, all this legalism, hoops jumping. Where are the merry hearts that do as good as a medicine? You don't want to be flaky, but you don't want to be bound either. So I was really going to talk about, I was supposed to talk about divine flexibility. Now, if you are led by the Holy Spirit, you don't want to be legalistic. You want to be led by the Bible to see if it's really, you know, if it witnesses to your peace in your heart, letting the Lord lead you by the inward witness of the Holy Spirit, and then by the Bible, you're balanced. You're not a kook. And that's one reason, another reason why fellowshipping with the saints, taking time out to fellowship, iron sharpens iron, be with other, you know, Christians, is important because then you can, you know, it helps you to develop to say, am I off? Can I ask a question? That type of thing. So when we do this, we have a reason, a real reason to go fellowship. But nowadays, because there is a lot of prison house law and friendly fire, my pet peeve, <laughs> the accuser, bossy, <laughs> not E-O-R-R, -R, Hey, I fellowship when I can. I have a merry heart. I want to keep it that way. I fellowship where they're not going to be putting me in a prison. They're not going to be beating me down with their law, or they're not going to be so celebrity and aristocratic that they're or no earthly good. I want to be with real folk, even if I find them at the coffee shop, where there are a lot of them out there. It's nice to fellowship there. I fellowship anywhere. So my criteria in the last few years has gotten... I'll fellowship anywhere because I just was tired of the legalism, tired of the accusation, tired of the put downs when all you want to do is love Jesus. You don't, you mean I have to know all these extra things? That's Phariseeism. The Bible says that Jesus rebuked, he openly rebuked in red letters in the whole chapter practically of Matthew 23. He rebuked the system. The legalistic, Pharisee, people-pleasing, money-centric system. And he did it out loud. He did it on in public. He wasn't shy. And he did it in front of the multitude and his disciples. Read it. And one of the things Jesus fussed at and rebuked the Pharisees, the picky, finicky Pharisees, legalists, he says, you're making these people twice as fit for hell as you are themselves. You're adding all these extra rules that don't need to be there. My father doesn't want all these people to follow all these rules. It puts them under your bondage, your bondage. He didn't say your bondage, but that's what he says, bondage. 
because it's making people now I have to if I'm going to dig this is how I feel really truly if I'm going to go there I have to be careful I can't really be me if because I'm untamed and if I'm too happy they're going to think I'm up to something which is true <laughs> they think that all right if I'm a female who thinks like teaches men and women what do I do they don't believe in that if I'm too carefree, I'm not going to worry about all this stuff. Not into people pleasing. Not you know, I'm into harmony and relationships. I'm not caring if what you dress like or what you look like or if you're you know just so you're pure in heart. If there are all these little, we got to bow and scrape for the headmaster when he comes in. We got to bow and scrape for him and her. We got to people please. I just don't think that is right. I think that's a custom that people want to have. And uh, if you want people to really behave and have good order, you teach them respect. You teach them about relationships. James 3.17, Ephesians 4, meekness and lowliness and long suffering with everybody. And God will do the trick. God will do it on them. But you don't have to have the pomp and ceremony of hierarchy. And celebrity to me, I cannot tell you how disappointed, how sad I'd never been around celebrity in the last 10 years. I cannot tell you the cult spirit and the people, it's just and the watching for people to protect their turf. My dad, who is a pastor, unsung pastors in small churches, thank God for you, thank God for your ministry. We need you because you're not doing that, most of you. A few do. If you're one of the ones that want to get big and famous one day, you might do that. But we don't want that. We just want real people. So if we were, and I think a lot of the people that are older are compassion fatigued, maybe. They've seen, you know, like Eli, <laughs> they've seen too much. We got to let God renew us and rejuvenate us. All right. So let us go forth, and I think of the word divine flexibility. When you look at how people can be led by the Holy Spirit, you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, He gives you the Holy Spirit, you learn about that, and then you can tr learn slowly to discover how God will lead you by the inward witness, His peace. And then you learn more and you grow and you read your Bible to stay balanced and, you know, that type of thing. Get fellowship. Well, in the course of being led by the Holy Spirit, it's like two scriptures. One is Genesis 5, the prophet Enoch. The prophet Enoch was grandchild of Adam and he walked and talked with God daily and one day God took him. Ironically, after 365 years, I think that's a funny number that he lived that long, like a year, you know, but he walked and talked with God daily. And to me, there's a whole crowd. Of, I mean, there are countless millions that do this right now are walking and talking with God. I'm not saying they're all prophets or they're all going to be taken away, but it sounds like a generation of Enoch's ready. <laughs> the other part is they're being led by the spirit 24-7. 365. That is another scripture that balances that, and that is the Ezekiel wheel vision of chapter 1. Chapter 1 of Ezekiel's wheel, it talks about this heavenly gyroscope. It's like a gyroscope, the, the wheel within a wheel, like a gyroscope, and it's like the Holy Spirit says, go this way, and the Spirit of the Lord says, go this way, it goes that way, and it says, no, go this way, it goes like that way. So years ago when I was being learning about my life and my call, 20 some years ago, I mean, through the years, the Lord just saying, it's like a divine appointment ministry. You have a divine appointment. You're not sent to everybody. You're not chosen to go all these places and you don't have time to, with all, to, to do all this stuff. So you've got to be careful and precise and let the Lord lead you where to go, who to deal with, who not to, where to go to church, how when to work out, when to stay home, when to do nothing. You know, just a lot of amazing divine flexibility. It's a divine flexibility. It's so joyful. There's no, it's very restful. And um, 
you know, one of the things is I don't have time. I don't feel it's my responsibility to mind your business. I don't feel it's my responsibility to guess about your business. It's just not my big, it's not to import it. It's not in the fear of the Lord, frankly, to do that. But to give an idea of how maybe to, to relax more, to not be chafing at stress, and just to be in the right place at the right time. It's so important now, more than, more than ever, to be in the right place at the right time because of all the weird stuff and all the mischief going on, and to train your kids the same way, to be led by the Spirit, by the peace. Ironically, and very cool, when I first started, when God first talked to me about James 3.17, I've always taught it since the 90s, that verse, James 3.17 and 2 Timothy 1.7, as discernment, clarity words. This can help you decide if it's God, your flesh, or the, you know, the devil talking to you. So the main thing to know about when you get and you process an inward impression, a strong inward impression, when it recurs, you know, you want to make sure it's not going to make you anxious, you, that it's not from the dark side. So you can test it with James 3.17 because it says that the wisdom that comes from above, the wisdom that comes from above is first of all what? Pure, peaceable easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It's not going to be dirty. It's not going to be impure. It's going to be peaceful, respectful. It's going to be not dogmatic, not fighting to get its way. It's not going to be biased or racist or gender biased, age biased. It's not going to be people pleasing. It's not going to be a hypocrite, a phony. It's going to be have good fruit. What is good fruit? Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit that is the fruit of the spirit. Paul writes about pure, let's see, goodness, meekness, patience, temperance. That means self-control, meekness. Did I get them out of order? Yes. But anyway, those are the ones Galatians 22, 20, Galatians 22, Galatians 5, 22, 23. So when we have James 3, 17, to discern and process what we're hearing. Is it God or not? Well, is it pure? Do I feel peace or do I feel worked up and afraid? So that's very helpful. If it's, you're afraid, you know it's not God. If it's pushy, driving you, you know, that's not the Lord. Secondly, 2 Timothy 1.7 is another one. God has not given me a spirit of fear but of power, his power, his love, and a sound mind. So if you're oppressed, depressed, suppressed, okay, if you're feeling worry, or if you have a nightmare, see, this, these, are the, these are the subjective realms of this. There's a lot of realms of it. There's no formula. You can't make a formula. It's just too subjective. you just got to be in tune with God, do your best, make some mistakes, get back on the horse, and ride again. Know your Bible. If you really have a question, feel free to ask people. You ask somebody else. Do you, what do you, a mature Christian, what do you feel? But it's better. It's always better if you and God and the Bible get it right. Not have to, because other people are human. So it says there are two main clarifying verses for interpreting, you know, discerning if it's God or not. No fear is the big one. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So if it does, it's spooky, makes you oppressed, makes you worried, it's not of the Lord. That's Second Timothy 1.7. The other one is James 3.17. So all these things tie right in with a peaceable quality of life. You can't always be peaceable, but you can certainly work to preserve the maximum amount of quality life that you can. That's how I do it. And I am very grateful and full of joy usually all the time, really most of the time. It is shocking from what I, my life, you know, it has just been amazing that proof that no matter who, what, 
what you don't have, what you do have, who leaves you, who doesn't. God is bigger and he's there. It is so amazing. It's such a marvelous, you know, if Jesus hadn't come and allowed me to make him my savior, invite him to live in my heart, allow him to give me the free deposit of the Holy Spirit. And then when I was 20, I asked for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, filling with the Spirit, speaking in tongues. That helps a lot. Then all the great teaching that we've had, all the great worship we have. There's so many amazing things God has done. Guess why? But if he hadn't died and suffered on the cross for our sins to overcome, help us overcome accusation and how to handle it when we are accused by forgiving. If he hadn't have done all these things and then died and gotten resurrected, I couldn't give this testimony. I don't know what I would have done. I'd be dead. I'm going to kill myself. I would have been dead a thousand times had I not been for the resurrected Christ, for the resurrected ever-present Jesus. What I would love to do, I was thinking the other day, I would love to have a website, a testimony website, where people write in and talk about the God who's there. It makes me want to cry because he is there. People have no clue. A lot of people have no clue God is that real, that it is a relationship. It's not a bunch of rules. It's not a bunch of malarkey. It is a real God, a real person, and he's there, and he's dear, and he's fun. I have fun with him. So I'd love to hear testimonies of people, just little incidences, basic everyday experiences where you know God is there. If you would like to send something in and your testimony a little short, I knew God was there when, and you write a paragraph, just write me at dfwleader at gmail.com, the God who is there. If I get a few of these, I'll start a website. If I get how many? Three to ten, I'll start a website just for that, and it will be everybody's website, not just mine. We will have the God who is there. I just think that is so cool. Another thing is, uh, years ago, there was this group uh, that had a campground, a Pentecostal group, or somebody somebody that were in the more country, you know, like in the more rural area where I used to live. And one of their people, one of their leaders in their movement, because I, I, I move about the Christian body. I all like all kinds. I really do. I can hang with them tongue talkers. I can hang with them liturgy, liturgy people, black and white. I just like them. So, and it's God's grace. But anyway, there was somebody had written a book. And all it was was little times God answered his prayer. The man's prayer. The Pentecostal preacher's prayer. And it was just like little one page, little page testimony. I needed shoes. I remember one of them. I needed shoes. And so he wrote about how he had prayed and God answered his prayer that he got shoes. So that's another one I would not mind doing is another one just how God showed up. But I can't do too much. So let's focus. That could count on the first one, and that would be the God who's there. I'd love to do that one. So if anybody wants to share little instances, vignettes about how God proved that he was really there please write in at dfwleader at gmail.com and i'll put the posting of the website on um online fellowship on the right onlinefellowship.us now i cannot write back because i don't have time or energy to do it all but if you don't hear from me just trust if i don't get three to ten then I will not do it. But I have a feeling that if I keep on doing this, we're going to get plenty <laughs> and overload because God is there. I know a lot of people know him. So anyway, God is good. He is so good and his mercy endures. This is Tavo DRC signing off for now. Be calm. Be Ask God to give you strength to be patient. And abide in James 3.17 in all relationships with God's help. God bless you. He loves you. This is Tavo DRC signing off for now.